Quick little disclaimer before I go into the meat of this video. Um, why it took so long to get this video out was because I was dumb and tried to make a, another video in between it. I don't know why I do that, but I do. Um, and it was like an 18 minute video on The Masked Singer and it was basically just me rambling. I didn't even show my face. I was just like, you know what, no one's gonna wanna watch this. I'll just delete it and keep going with what I was planning to do, which was this. So, yep, here we go, Drake Tribe. Now, uh, time for a little unpopular opinion. I honestly think the Drake Tribe is very overrated, and here's why. People are always saying that, oh, but the Drake Tribe, they're one of the greatest tribes in Survivor history. Well... Statistically, they're not. I mean, they went into the merge with the same amount of people as Morgan, which meant that they lost the same amount of immunities that Morgan did. And then if we look at immunities, um, yeah, Morgan won a lot of the, the post-merge immunities, like Dara and Lil their wins make up, like, half, no, more than that, a decent chunk of all the immunities, um, in the post-merge, so, getting that out of the way, uh, Drake, in my opinion, is not as good as people let on, they were still better than Morgan, because at least they, for the most part, had their stuff together, Morgan was all over the place, but honestly, like, Drake is only a little bit better than Morgan. Now, the only department where Morgan is actually, uh, or, sorry, where Drake is actually totally whooping Morgan is, like, the, the players. I mean, the winner came from Morgan, that's why, uh, sorry, ah! <laughs> the winner came from Drake, which is why we're doing it last, and besides that, you know, you have a bunch of, a plethora of really good contestants from this tribe. But we also had a lot of bad ones, and that's what we're starting with, and number eight is none other than, honestly, I think you guys would be pretty surprised by this, but number eight, I have Michelle Tesoro. Oh, Michelle. Yeah, nobody has had more of a derailment than her, from what I've seen. Also, technically, due to the outcast twist, she's the first Drake boot, but that's not why she's on here, This at number eight. Uh, at first, she was the naive college student girl archetype, but she quickly found an alliance in Burton and Sean, and now they weren't the most help helpful around camp, and they weren't the nicest either. As a matter of fact, Rupert compared the three to a clique of popular kids that would pick on him in high school. In the fourth episode, Drake decided to pull a sook giant and throw the next immunity comp because they were beginning to grow sick of one another, and heads needed to roll. This put a huge dent in Michelle's alliance, and she began to realize her days on the island were numbered. Then came the gross food immu immunity challenge on day 15. Michelle cooked up a strategy for how to win it. For those who don't know, the gross food challenge always involves, follows the same formula. The tribes take turns sending one person to take a shot at the challenge. If someone is able to eat or drink all their portion, they score a point for their tribe. If, if at the end at the, of the predetermined, predetermined amount of rounds, there is a tie, which normally there is, the tribes get to pick someone from the other tribe to face off in a sudden death round. The first person to finish wins immunity for their team. Michelle apparently had an iron stomach, so she told Drake that she she would feign utter disgust during the comp so that Morgan would pick her in a case of a tie. Then she'd pull out the big guns and send Morgan to their fourth straight, or, not their fourth straight, but their fourth tribal council. But, uh, then she kind of forgot to pretend to be grossed out and showed off when it was her turn. They did go to a tiebreaker and Morgan selected Sandra instead, and sure enough, Drake lost. At that point, there was no way Michelle wasn't going. She was the whole reason they lost, and her fate was essentially sealed. One moment she was at the top of the world, and the next her torch was snuffed. The lesson here? Don't mess with Rupert Boneham. Trish was in an alliance with Sandra, Krista, and Rupert, and for the most part, they were in the majority of the Drake alliance, considering Michelle and Burton were picked off and John was a wild card at, the, at that point. Then came the sixth immunity comp, which they lost, and it looked like it was going to be Sean's turn to go. Then Trish conspired with a few members of Drake to blindside Rupert. Now, granted, her reasoning was legit. They were heading into the merge portion of the game where Rupert would now be a physical threat, and this time, his, his time spent as a captive of the Morgan tribe did leave some of his allies worried about a shift in loyalty. But Sandra and Krista didn't like this, and they warned Rupert, who then enlisted the now saved Sean to vote Trish. She, she, did, she tried to take down a giant, but she just didn't know her audience that well. Now, Sean is one of those middle ground players. He obviously wasn't going to win, but he also wasn't really in a position to go home that early, which is ironic considering he was the last pre-merge boot, 
Well, that is also interesting because Sean is by far one of the most screwed by a twist player in the history of the game. That sentence was a train wreck. But prior to this outcast twist, his main allies, Burton and Michelle, got voted out in back-to-back -back episodes. And up to this point, Sean was sort of getting on people's nerves. He was a jerk to Rupert, and he wasn't the most helpful at camp. I mean, you know someone's toxic when they get into a fight with Johnny Fairplay and come out as the bad guy. But anyways, following Trish's warranted blindside at the final 11, we had Sandra, Krista, and Rupert in the majority alliance, with John and Sean on the outskirts just kind of vibing, not really sure what would come next. Sean was more of a pariah than John due to John being sort of a swing vote at this point. So when the outcasts sent both Morgan and Drake to the tribal council, as we explained in the previous episode, it was sort of uh, the end of the line for Sean. Now, most people are going to be like, why? Why do you have Johnny Fairplay at number five? He's the best player from Pearl Islands and blah, blah, blah. Stop! You know, Johnny Fairplay, wow. I, I don't care what the fans say. He's the most unlikable player of all time, starting with the pre-merge Johnny Fairplay. He was always picking fights with people and getting on Drake's nerves. He rubbed Morgan the wrong way the one time he looted them, and when he cast a swing vote to get out Burton over Krista, he got a huge head and started acting like he was the king of the game, which, yeah, I'll admit he had some power this season. Uh, but once Burton came back to the outcasts, John just sort of pretended he never voted him out, and they joined forces going into the merge. After they got out Andrew at the final 10, they got Lil Tawana and Dara on their side to pick off the Drake alliance of Sandra, Rupert, and Krista. Uh, they were relatively successful at that, but John was still painted as the bad guy that he was. Then came the final reward challenge. Sorry, the final seven reward challenge, which most avid Survivor fans know what's coming next. It was the love one's visit, and John had his friend come as his loved one. Uh, his friend brings some bad news. John's grandmother had died. The rest of the cast feel sad for him, and they all throw the newlyweds game-esque comp for him. Well, except for Sandra. You could tell Sandra. Sandra knew from the get-go that John was sus. Uh, but little did they know, it was all a lie. And a poorly executed lie at that. It, even if I knew that that was coming, because I love to destroy myself and watch uh survivor videos like before i see the season so i knew this was coming um but like it was so blatantly obvious even though i knew it was gonna happen like had i not known i would have been like like they thought that they were doing they thought that they pulled it off but their acting is just horrendous um, but yeah, no, his grandmother was alive and well, and according to Fair Play, she was watching Jerry Springer. After that, John's alliance cruised on until the final five, where he and Burton were blindsided by the remaining Morgan ladies. By some miracle, John finds himself at the final three, where he loses final immunity to Lil, which is hilarious. Uh, now John, ha now had John won this comp, either Lil or Sandra would still win against John, I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, I, I guess that's not true. I think, I think if John took... Lil to the final two instead of Sandra, then I think it would have been the same exact situation that we saw actually play out. Um, John would probably win, but you never know. Uh, that's the bottom line. Johnny Fairplay was a somewhat good player, and that is not giving enough credit to him, I guess, because people actually think he's one of the best players or something like that. Uh, but his downfall is m more in part to flaws in his strategy than his general unlikability. What I don't understand is when people on the internet say that Burton was John's sidekick, because I always saw Burton as the one taking charge between the two, mainly because, you know, Johnny Fairplay's like a little weakling. He's a little, you know, I, I, I just, you know, like if we saw Johnny Fairplay and Burton get into a fight, well we know what's gonna happen, you know, Burton's gonna, Burton's gonna steamroll, steamroll him. Now, the funny thing about Krista is that she was sort of a floater. She never really made any big moves, despite being in the majority alliance for most of her season. Uh, she was more of a physical threat than she appeared. She came very close to winning a lot of challenges, only to lose to either, like, Burton or Dara. Besides Burton's first elimination, Krista was never really in any danger of going, and then at the final six, Burton and Johnny Fairplay's alliance set their sights on getting Krista out, and at this point, she was sort of on the outs of the camp. Rupert was gone, and her and Sandra were sitting ducks. Uh, it didn't help that Krista took the blame for emptying the fish bucket, and Rupert was blind after Rupert was blindsided, and that was really the point that Krista lost her footing on the game. 
Here we go, the cat with nine lives, or I guess two lives, but you know, that doesn't sound as good. Burton was at first a key part of the Drake tribe. He was a physical asset and was well-liked around camp. Then Drake got hit of, got a hit of the Sukjai syndrome when a team on an immunity winning streak decides to throw a challenge to weed out a teammate everyone is sick of. And I'm just realizing I already made that reference earlier in the video. Poor writing on my part. Tensions were only getting worse at Drake, and people were starting to get sick of Burton, which production never really showed why he was getting on people's nerves. I honestly feel like at the beginning of the season, he was very, very undershown, under-edited. Uh, tensions, yeah. Um, at the merge... Keep it together. Okay. He was voted out, and mere days later, he was voted back in from the Outcast tribe. At the merge, he buried the hatchet with Rupert, only to dig it back up and bury it again, this time in Rupert's back. And from here, he and John created the biggest villain alliance yet, despite the Morgan girls not being much of villains. They were actually pretty nice. He coasted on to the final five, scheming and occasionally cutting one of his allies along the way, but then he makes a seriously stupid and underratedly stupid decision, taking John with him on the final five reward, which, if you don't remember, Remember was like they basically had like a picnic at like the remains of the um the ruins of like some Panamanian city. Uh yeah, and because they he did that, he left Sandra, Lil, and Dara back at camp. This sounds at first like there's nothing bad that could come of this until you realize that Sandra gets uh in Lil and Dara's head and convinces them to turn on Burton. Uh, Burton happens to lose the next immunity, and then he's blindsided. Yeah, this, is what this is what makes this season just so good. Whereas Marquesas and Amazon had the first true documented examples of flipping on an alliance, even though I guess you could argue that that also kind of happens in... Um, in uh, 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 why don't I... Australia... Uh, Pearl Islands was chock full of flipping, blindsiding, and backstabbing. Wait a minute! The winner isn't at number one! Well, wait a minute. Jenna, Jenna wasn't number one in the last Survivor ranking, so whatever. Uh, well, unlike Jenna in the Amazon, I don't think Sandra didn't deserve the million. It's just that it feels like this wasn't her game to win. Usually... Um, yeah, she didn't win that many challenges, which is not a huge part of what makes a winner a good winner. It's just that... I feel like she's a more under-edited winner, you know. She had a social gameplay, very similar to Vesepia and Tina. Yet I feel like her A-plus gameplay moments weren't really as shown as well. Overall, she was the best social player. She didn't make any enemies, but wasn't necessarily so well-liked that nobody wanted to take her to the end. Um, she was just kind of how always play this, you know, e even in her own words, as long as it's not me kind of gameplay. And that's something fresh that we ne had never seen from a winner. All the other winners is like, you know, I want to pull the strings. Even people like Tina and Vesepia that, you know, weren't really like really hard players. They still, you know, weren't just looking out for themselves. Uh, yeah. O overall, yeah. Um... One of the first observations I made about Sandra was that she sat back and watched the rest of the Drake tribe kind of set each other on fire. She was that kind of player that referred to, preferred to watch the madness as it unfurled, which kind of connects to the as long as it isn't me. Uh, she let everyone basically destroy their own game. Apper, um, ap <laughs> After Rupert's elimination, she threw out the rest of the Balboa, which was the merged tribe's fish, so, it's also not like she was non-confrontational or anything. Everyone was afraid to take Lil to the final two because, you know, she was the most likable player left. But Sandra ended up going to the finale with her anyways. Um, and, yeah. Uh, as it turned out, the jury valued her strategy and overall stellar gameplay over Lil's sheer likability. What also made Sandra a good winner is that she was loyal to her allies. She took Rupert and Krista as far as she could, and the only time she ever really screwed someone over on a deal was with John and Burton, and they kind of deserved it. Now, yes, Sandra's win was definitely satisfying. It's just that there's one person from Drake who, had he won, it would have made the whole season come full circle. Rupert. That's right, I put the first two-time winner of Survivor below Rupert. I say that like Rupert's a bad player, but you know what I mean. And here's the thing. Um, when I look for, when I, when I think about seasons of Survivor, 
I think about what the narrative of this season was pointing to. There's always at least one player who the entire season was through their perspective, basically, was through their narrative. This was Richard in Borneo and Colby in the Outback, Lex in Africa, um, really not anyone in Marquesas, but that, you know what I mean? And so the person who drives the narrative isn't always the one who ends up on top, and this is the case. From the first episode, all eyes were on Rupert. He essentially ran a monopoly on the confessionals. Survivor Pearl Islands was the story of Rupert Bonaham. This dude was an ox, both in strength and work ethic. He had fish practically coming out of his behind. At one point, Sean tried to go spear hunting and lost the three-pronged tip of the spear. And Rupert swam out around the perimeter of the Drake tribe, which is not that small, pretty big. And he found it in mere minutes. He found that thing almost right away. Whereas I guarantee you, almost anyone else, it would take them hours to find it, if they find it at all. It was memorable, quotable, and downright hysterical. So if he was so great, why did he only come in 8th place? Because even though he had most players under the influence of his charm, like the entire Morgan tribe, there were always people on his own tribe even that were against him. At a few points in the pre-merge, members of Drake would conspire on how to get rid of Rupert, or if they could even afford to do so. Anytime this notion was brought up, anyone who said it was almost guaranteed to get their torch snuffed. Rupert had so much power going into the merge, it was like... He was looking to be like a repeat of the Outback with Colby, but this time, J Rupert was not going to make the same mistake that Colby did. And after two merge eliminations, it looked like Drake was just gonna pugong Morgan and that would be the end of it. But no, 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 Burton and Fairplay were getting sick of having to compete against them, so they essentially rescued the three Morgan ladies and promised to keep them safe if they voted with them. Their first target was obvious. What was supposed to be a 5-3 to three vote to send either Tawana or Dara home became a 5-3 to three to send Rupert home. It was definitely the most shocking elimination in Survivor history up to that point. And there's a reason why Rupert got asked to play on All-Stars instead of Burton or John. It's called karma! And considering how well everything else went for Rupert, there was no way he wouldn't have the last laugh.